right. Well, it is my pleasure to be with you all this evening. And I'm excited to be able to, to bring the Word of God to you during our worship service. Uh, I've been looking forward to, to visiting with you all again. I think the last time I was here was probably about a year ago. And um, it saddens me the circumstances which brought me to be asked back. But uh, again, I am grateful to be able to be uh, asked to bring your, the Word to you today. Um, I just ask that you join with me one more time in a word of prayer uh, as we look into the Song of Songs and uh, what is to be a joyful sermon uh, reflecting on the love of Jesus Christ for His bride. Join with me once more, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you please help me today as your saints sit before me, and your bride is assembled together to worship you. Lord Jesus, would you make yourself glorious before them today? Would you fill their hearts with affection for you, burning affection to worship you, cause their eyes to see your glory and to delight in you, Show us your works as we see in Psalm 90. Satisfy us with your loving kindness. And convict us of sin when we have neglected your glory. Convict us of finding delight in lesser things. And would you open our eyes to your glory? And I pray that if there are any here who do not know you, that they may see this word which we are going to read, hear this word preached, and they would be filled with jealousy of the love that you have for your bride. A jealousy that will provoke them to consider their place before you. Would you draw sinners to yourself today? And even more, would you draw saints to yourself today, your bride, to seek you in holy communion? We love you and we thank you and we confess that we do not love you as you deserve to be loved or as we ought to love you. And so we ask for your spirit to help us where we have failed. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was asked to preach today, um, I was excited. Um, and as I was contemplating what word to bring today, what, what sermon to preach um, what to offer to God's people, uh, I really couldn't think of a better option when addressing this local body, this body of assembled believers, brothers and sisters, whom I dearly love, many friends of mine who I've gotten to know over the years, and the last year, even the last few months. I couldn't think of a better option than to point you all, to point the bride of Christ assembled here back to that foundational doctrine of the great love of Jesus Christ for his bride. And so there's no better way, in my opinion, to remind the church of this timeless tr truth of unending and unfailing, abiding, loving kindness and covenant faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ for His people than to look back at this controversial book of Song of Solomon. We'll be doing kind of a short survey through the whole book. Uh, we'll be looking at least partially through parts of chapter 1. Uh, we really will get into chapter 8. Uh, so it will be a very short survey, a very brief survey throughout the book. Uh, but our main focus, our chief focus, is an excerpt out of the end of chapter 4 through parts of chapter 6. Before we get to the text today, the Song of Solomon, as we read it today, and as many Christians read it today, it's a mystery to many Christians. It's a conundrum. Uh, it's, it's controversial. Um, and I would wager, I would... Uh, I would state my case that the book is very often misinterpreted. It's poorly interpreted. Perhaps it's better to say that the book is underinterpreted, and therefore the themes and the teachings of this book are very shallowly applied. Many times Christians are left wondering what to do with this book as they read it or after they read it. Young Christians are warned not to touch these pages. Don't open to that book yet. This is not for you. Uh, if you are single, don't touch that piece of Scripture. They're warned as though reading this song will send them into a fit of rebellion. 
As though not all of Scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction, and training in righteousness. Many Christians think this song is full of strong themes of sexuality and marriage. And they're right. It's there. And so they conclude that it's therefore reserved only for the married, lest one unprepared twist the Scriptures and fall into a pit of temptation. And while those who hold to this heavy literalism in their interpretation are partially correct, those themes are present in at least part of this book, though I would even wager that it's not uh, as prolific throughout the whole book as some would say. Whatever their interpretation is, however correct they may be, they certainly understand some of the thematic elements. Regardless, they miss the greater subject of the song. I can't tell you how many times I've talked about the importance of this song with brothers and sisters in passing conversation. Talked about how it's encouraging, how it's delightful, how it is... Every time I open these books, I'm drawn back to the abiding and steadfast love of Christ. Only to have brothers look at me like I've lost my mind. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Song of Solomon. That's your go-to. And it's almost as though many don't see a reason for this, as one brother put it, this almost pornographic book to be can, included in the canon. I've had brothers tell me that they only use, the only use that they see for this book is for a husband and a wife behind closed doors to read it together in private. And much of this is thanks to a shallow, lazy, thoughtless, hyper-literalist interpretation of this book, detached from a historical interpretation of this book, coupled with young, edgy preachers who are more concerned with being provocateurs than faithful expositors of the text. Tending to the blood, beloved bride of Christ, they would rather get more clicks on YouTube than really tend to Christ's bride, tend to His flock and see them fed and provided for, than to see Christ glorified in the reading of all of His Word. So I want to be absolutely clear this evening. The glorious themes of marital bliss are explicitly present in the Song of Solomon. They are there, and I will not deny them. But they are not the point of the book. If you look at the Song of Solomon only for what it has to say about your marriage and the health of your marriage, and specifically the relation of husband to wives, if you only look at it as a, a beautiful, poetic uh, standard of how husbands speak to wives and how husbands pursue wives and how they are united together in intimate devotion to one another, you are missing the beautifully woven, Holy Spirit-inspired tapestry for a few bright threads, if that is your chief focus in this book. Because the themes of God-honoring spousal relations being fully present and of extreme importance to the song, they are only peripheral to this book. This evening, I want to reorient your scope then of interpretation to the historical way, the way which our fathers held in interpreting this for centuries which is first and primarily to reveal the abiding, steadfast love of God for His covenant people. More specifically, the deep, patient, enduring, and intimate love of Jesus Christ for His bride, the church, and every member therein. So now as we turn to the text, first we have to deal with some introductory matters about the song. The Song of Solomon is essentially it's a dramatic unfolding of the love affair of a common young woman and the king that she desires. It is a drama. It is like a play on a stage which we are bearing witness to. We read in the voices of three characters. We read in the voice of the bride and the groom and interestingly enough, the chorus. It's almost as though the chorus is for us, the audience, to participate in this drama. But we watch through these eyes. Throughout the book, we see this kind of dramatic conversation between the bride and the groom, sporadically interjected with a third-party group of observers, which is the chorus, whether it is the daughters of Jerusalem, the family of the bride, uh, or any others. But this poem, it's titled the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs. It's titled Solomon's Song. In fact, the first verse, the Song of Songs, Chapter 1, verse 1, which is Solomon's. This is Solomon's song. However, not only, excuse me, this is Solomon's song, but it's ultimately 
the bride's song. Not only do we hear the bride's voice, not only is she the central character, the central theme throughout, but she is the only one whose internal thoughts we actually hear in this. We don't hear the internal dialogue of the king speaking to himself, contemplating the beauty of the bride. We hear him tell the bride how beautiful she is. We don't hear the internal thoughts of the chorus. We hear them declare their thoughts to the bride and the groom. But the bride we hear from her internal voice, her internal monologue. The whole song is from the perspective of the bride. And that should enlighten us to see what's really being talked about here then. If this is Solomon's song, but this is the bride's song. This is the Sol- Solomon's song. Solomon, the bride, the king is someone greater. More on that in a moment. So to get the most out of this song, we have to understand the characters then. We have the bride, we have the groom, and we have the chorus. The two most important are the bride. Let's look at the two most important are the bride and the groom. So let's look at the bride. The bride, she loves and passionately desires the love of the groom. These are some of the characteristics of each of the characters. So we see that in chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Look at this with me. We'll read it together. We'll see the passionate love and desire for the bride, for the king. He said, she says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. Now skip down to verse 7 from chapter 1. She calls out to the king, tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where do you shepherd your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flock of your companion? We see also her passion for her beloved once she catches his attention in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. On my bed, night after night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but did not find him. She says to herself, I must arise now and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but didn't find him. She has a passionate desire, this consuming desire to be with this one whom she loves, the king. She describes herself as beautiful, yet common and undesirable. We see that in chapter 1 again. Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. She speaks to the chorus here after declaring her love for the groom. Almost to ask the question of how could he love me? Why should I pursue him? She says, I am black but lovely. That means her skin is scorched by the sun. She's spent time working out in the sun. Her skin is dark. It's not lightened because of a life of luxury. I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look at me because I am swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me a caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. She is abused by her family. She has a vineyard, more on that later, on a a garden which she wants to present to her beloved, but she's not allowed to keep it herself. She thinks she's beautiful but commonly undesirable, and her abusive family says the same about her. Flip to the very end of the book. See what they say, her brothers, what they have to say about their sister. In chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, they say, We have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, we'll barricade her with planks of cedar. They're saying she's a little girl. She can't be desired by a groom. She can't go off to marry. We will stop this from happening. And again, the bride, the, the girl, the one who is pining after this king, her beloved, she's kept a garden in hopes of presenting it to her beloved. She says, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me a caretaker of the vineyards, their vineyards. But I have not taken care of my own vineyard. She has not had the time. She hasn't had the ability to tend to this garden which she keeps for her beloved. And this garden is something which comes up multiple times throughout this book. It is one of those central themes which we will spend much of our time in in this sermon. But what about the groom? The groom is regal and powerful. He's called Solomon in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. The chorus, or perhaps the bride, looks and says, Who is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke? 
as rising incense of myrrh and frankincense with all scented powders of the merchants. So you can imagine this, this pillar of smoke across the horizon, over the hills, uh, through the trees. You see this powerful pillar of smoke and you know something is coming. Someone powerful. Someone who has much riches. You can, hear the, you can smell the scent of his smoke as he's coming through. The scent of his incense, his frankincense and myrrh. They say, behold, verse 7, it is the traveling couch of Solomon. Sixty mighty men around it of the mighty men of Israel. All of them are those who seize the sword, learned in war. Each man has his sword at his side, guarding against the dreadful things of the night. It is King Solomon coming to his bride to marry his bride. He's regal and powerful. He's surrounded by powerful men. The mighty men of Israel who will destroy their enemies with the swift attack of their swords. He's seating on a sedan chair, a throne that is made of the beautiful cedars of Lebanon, outfitted with gold and silver. He's seen from far off. Everyone knows who he is. This is the groom. This is the one whom the bride desires. He is, in fact, desired by everyone, all of the daughters of Jerusalem. Chapter 1, verse 3, Your oils have a pleasing fragrance, the bride says to the groom. Your name is like purified oil, therefore the maidens love you. Every eligible woman wants to be with this man. They all love this king. They desire him. And he is a gracious and kind king. He is tender and loving to the one who catches his eye. In chapter 1, verse 9, he declares the bride, the bride who questions her beauty, the bride who says she is common, she is beaten, she is abused, she is scorched by the sun. He declares the bride beautiful in chapter 1, verse 9. He says, To a mare of mine among the chariots of Pharaoh, I compare you, O my darling. She stands out among the throng. The chariots of Pharaoh, these mighty horses for battle, and his mare is the one that catches his eye. Verse 10, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. He declares her beautiful and he makes her so. He outfits her with accessories. He makes these garments for her. He makes earrings for her to adorn her cheeks. He makes a necklace for her. And he compliments these beads of silver which he gives to her. He is this groom. He is a king and a shepherd. Chapter 1, verse 7, the bride calls out, Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where do you shepherd your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? And in chapter 2, verse 16, My beloved is mine and I am his, he who shepherds his flock among the lilies. Who is this shepherd and king? Is it Solomon? No. Oh. It is the great high shepherd and king of the land. It is Yahweh Himself, the Lord of glory. It is Jesus Christ. This love affair between Him and His bride that we are taking part in, that we are about to take a look into. And of course, the third character, this third party of participants in the drama unfolding, it's the chorus. And oftentimes the voices change. It's the bride's family at the end of chapter 8. Most often it's the daughters of Jerusalem interacting with the bride, interacting with the groom. And we'll see how they interact together. Of course, we see these themes. We see the picture of the groom who is powerful and regal, strong, providing for the one whom he loves. We see the picture of the bride who desires the groom. And (coughs) all of these things can be shown to be images and pictures of the beautiful covenant and relationship of marriage. We can say, yes, we see a picture of marriage here in this drama unfolding. We see the headship of the husband. We see his role in sanctifying his bride, the purifying and elevating of the bride in marriage. We see the deep love that the bride and the groom have for one another. But I say again, all of that is peripheral. All of that is secondary. It is important and it must be applied to our lives. We must look at this book and apply it to our marriages. And for those of us who are single, those of you who do not have a wife or a husband but are looking for one, we see this and it should prepare you for how you are to relate to your future spouse. But before we can make this application, we must first see That while the mystery of marital love in this song is great, it is, to quote Ephesians 5, speaking with reference to Christ and His church. So we look 
to our key text now. Chapter 4, verse 7 is where we will begin. In chapter 4, verse 7, it takes place kind of in the middle of the wedding ceremony. It is the culmination of the wedding day of the king and his beloved. That wedding takes place back in the beginning of chapter 3. It actually takes place from the portion of chapter 3 we read a moment ago where Solomon comes on his sedan chair and covered in the smoke and, and everyone's looking, everyone's watching. He's coming to his bride to marry her, to take her to himself. And we see in chapter 4 verse 7, nearing the end of their wedding day or the, their wedding ceremony even, we see the groom adoring the bride when he says in verse 7, You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. The king expresses his adoration for his beloved bride in this verse, leading up to this verse. He says, you are altogether beautiful. And I want you to keep in mind this picture. We see the drama here of Solomon taking a bride to himself. But, but the true substance of what is happening here is Christ adoring his bride as he comes to take her away with him as he comes to seek her face in communion, and he says to her, he says to his saints, you are altogether beautiful. Now, in the context of this drama, this young woman, she may say, how can he love me like this? How can this king, the one whom everyone desires and loves, the one who rules the world, how can he delight in me? How can he look at me and say, I am altogether beautiful? He must mean another. You remember she is scorched and blistered from the sun in her hard labors. In chapter 1 we see this. But still the king says, you are altogether beautiful. And what's more, he says, there is no blemish in you. You are not scarred by the sun, but you are beautiful and spotless. Most beloved and most desirable. And so does the Lord Jesus tell you this, saint. This is a blessing, an adoration for you, saint, if you have been washed by the very blood of Jesus. The Son of God delights in you. He says you are altogether beautiful to Him. Now, dear saints, perhaps you're at a season in your life, in this time, where you have taken an especially deep look at yourself. You've accounted your sins against the Lord. You've spent a great amount of time examining your life and the way you've lived your life for the Lord. And perhaps during this period of self-examination, you've seen, whether through your actions or your thoughts or your affections in this life, a dark blot of sin and idolatry that stains you and stains which appears to stain your soul. Maybe you've spent the past weeks crying out to the Savior in repentance, asking for forgiveness for your shallow heart towards Him lately. And now, here you sit under the reading of this Word. After these last weeks, this time of self-examination, and you hear this declaration of the King to His beloved bride, and you're brought to your knees. You're pierced to your heart, thinking, this cannot be for me. Look at my life in this last season, you think to yourself. Maybe I've tasted the delight of Christ, but I've only been deceiving myself. I know what's right and I still do what's wrong. Maybe I've been deceived into thinking that I am His, but He can't love me like this. But Christian, look at what the Savior says about you. About His, whom He died to purchase. He says, you are altogether beautiful. He calls you darling, and He says, there is no blemish in you. He is telling the truth, because Christ cannot lie. But He can't mean me, you say. He can't be referring to me. I've seen my sin. I know how far I am from the holiness of God. How can the holy, holy, holy God desire and love me like this? I know how wicked my heart is. 
I've heard it said that as a saint draws nearer to the Lord, as he pursues the Lord in communion, as he sees the holiness of God opened up to his eyes through the Word of God, applied to his heart by the Holy Spirit, that he sees how much farther away he is from the Lord. He is made more, he's made uncomfortable, whereas before he was comfortable in his sin. When he sees the holiness of God, he sees the, the, the span between him. He sees his own filthiness and rebellion that much more in contrast. And this experience makes Christian men and women a prime target for the attack of the enemy, to doubt their standing before Christ. And really, to doubt Christ's ability and willingness to save them. To doubt his ability as the Savior himself. The accusation goes like this. A whispering voice in your ear saying, look at you. Look at your life of filth. Look at how much time you've spent thinking that you're a Christian. And look at all that you've done. Just this last week, look what you've done. Look at how you still walk in this juvenile sin which you should have beaten by now, but you haven't because you love it. You don't love Christ. You don't belong to Him. You're deceived. You just think you're a Christian. And all this time, you don't even know what it means to be a Christian. And the lying voice of our enemy whispers and yells in our ear that he won't save you. He doesn't want you. It doesn't matter that you have faith. Yeah, you think he can be a perfect Savior, but look where your faith has gotten you now. Look at how much faith you've had in him, and you're still worshiping the same old sins. And all of those accusations lead a Christian to a pit of despair, where he strives so hard to please Jesus, where he spends so much time in the penalty box making penance for his past sins, hoping that maybe he could earn Christ's favor one more time, all because he doubts the ability of Christ to be a perfect Savior, his willingness to save such a sinner as yourself. And perhaps you're like this one. Perhaps you've heard this accusation. Perhaps you're dealing with this now, your internal struggle, your thoughts accusing you and condemning you now in this time. Perhaps you hear this and you're even condemned in your thoughts saying you have such little faith that you would doubt the Savior. Friends, silence the voice of the accuser. Silence the voice of our enemy by looking to Christ the Savior. And look to Him on the cross. Look to Him beaten and bloodied for your sin. Look to Him and see the willingness of a perfect Savior for a wretch like you. And look to Him in this text in verse 7 when He says, You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. What is saving faith if it is not when confronted with your own sin and your own disgusting filth in the light of God's holiness, what is saving faith if it is not looking to Jesus and trusting that He alone is your hope for salvation and trusting that if He is willing to die for sinners, He is willing to die for you. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked and bare before Him. We come to Him to be clothed, don't we? That is what saving faith is. Saving faith is taking the right inventory of your sinfulness, not brokenness, of your rebellion, not mistakes. Seeing the holiness of God and believing that He will save you. And that His work is sufficient to make you clean. Saving faith is taking inventory of your sin and believing, verse 7, talks about you because of what Christ has done. So rest and rejoice in the words of your King that you, lowly Christian, are altogether beautiful to Him. Once you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Once you were repulsive in the light and in the sight of the Lord of glory. But by the eternal loving kindness of your Lord and Master, your King, your God, your Groom has made you new. He has declared you altogether beautiful, saint. He has declared you His darling. And you are so 
Because only the Lord Jesus has the authority to declare this, to make it so by the very word of His mouth and by the finished work of His intercession. You have no more power in yourself today to deny the purifying work of Jesus on your behalf than you did or ever have to purify yourself apart from His blood. He is a perfect Savior. And those whom He died to purchase, He will save to the uttermost, no matter what. And so the king goes on. He calls to his bride in verse 8, and he says, Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Observe this call, the groom's call to his bride to come away. He calls her to come, to be near to him, to be alone with him. He calls her to intimately commune with him. But where does he call her from? He calls her from Lebanon, from the summits of Amana and Sinir and Hermon. These are all a mountain range near Lebanon. He calls her to come down to him from Lebanon, this place that is characteristic in the histories, the historical texts of Great comfort and wealth and abundance. The temple was built with the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon, the place that Solomon sent workers to 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 bring materials back. This place of, of luxury and beauty. And the king is calling her and inviting her. He is commanding her to forsake her previous dwellings of comfort and luxury on the mountains of, of Lebanon. Come away from those places. Come with me from Lebanon. He says she must part with these great heights to come and be with him. And it's not as though he's giving her some kind of contingent ultimatum saying, I'll love you if you leave Lebanon. If you want to receive my love, you must come with me. No, it's not an ultimatum. It's an announcement. It's a command from the overflow of his love saying, my bride, we will leave these great heights together because there is something better for us. And it shows how much more valuable the king is than even Lebanon itself. But what else lives in these mountains? Look at the text in verse 8. He says, come away with me from Lebanon. Come away from there. Come from those mountaintops at the the end of verse 8, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. There are beasts there that will seek to devour you. So come down from there, my love. Come to me, the king says, the groom says. Brothers and sisters, when you read these verses, do you smell the aroma of your king in these words? Do you hear the call to you to come away with him? Doesn't he call out to you in love, saying, come away with me to a secret place. Come and be alone. Doesn't He call you away from that old life which you once lived? The old life of luxury even, of comfort, to forsake those old ways to be His completely and alone, to forsake those old wicked delights of yours, the things that tie up your soul for destruction. Our Lord Jesus says this very word, this very same thing to His disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Verses 37-38, through 38, he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Oh, what sweet delight it is to be bid to come near to our Lord. To be bid even to die with Him. Because that is truly living. As our Lord tells us in verse 39 of Matthew chapter 10, He says, He who has found his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will surely find it. He's calling you to come away with Him, friends. Saints. He's calling you. He is commanding you to come down from the heights of the world. And don't you hear Him? Haven't you heard Him this last week? Are you His bride? then go away with Him. Don't let excuses separate you from Him. Senses of duty. More on that in a moment. But we must leave these old mountains and these hills. We must leave these old idols of family and security. Idols of comfort and materialism. We must leave them 
for our bridegroom who purchased us. May the cedars of Lebanon burn to dust if it means that I cannot be with the Lord Jesus. Because there are lions among those trees. There are leopards in these mountains that want to devour me, to devour you, your very soul. And if it means that you die, do you care? Do you care if it means that you can come away and be with your Lord? Do you cry out, let me be near to you in a quiet place when it seems that all else has gone astray? Brothers and sisters, we must come away with our Lord. It is not enough for corporate worship. It is not enough for family worship. There must be private worship as well. And what does he say of his bride? We continue on in verse 9. After he calls her away to him. After the Lord Jesus calls his bride away to communion with him. He says of her, You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. With a single strand of your necklace. He says, you have made my heart beat faster to this simple, common little girl who had nothing to offer him. But his love and his delight for her exhilarates him. With a single glance of her eye, he says, with a single look heavenwards, this little girl who was pining after the king as he tends his flock in the field, This little one who is watching over the fence, you can only imagine just dreaming that she can show him the garden that she's prepared. And he sees her. And on their wedding day, he says, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. His love for her is so deep. His desire is so strong that it only takes a glance. And he is moved by her. Brothers and sisters, we must look at this verse. We must see the love of Christ for His bride We must rejoice that He daily lives, stands in the presence of the Father to intercede on our behalf, to make intercession for us. And rejoice in the fact that when the Lord Jesus hears His bride, He is moved with compassion, with love, with a single glance of her eyes, His heart beats faster. It does not show this, the the love of Christ for His beloved bride. Yes, Jesus is your King. And as your King, you must revere Him and fear Him. You must. There is no choice. But He is your groom and your husband. And you must know just how deeply He loves you. When every time you fall on your knees, every time you lift your eyes heavenward, every time you seek the faith of the Lord Jesus simply to be with Him, you Make his heart beat faster. He looks down on you, this sinner come to the king in humble faith, and he doesn't look down with disdain. He doesn't look down with pity. He looks down with joy and desire and a passionate love. What honor to pray to your king. What joy should fill your soul simply to seek his face. And what joy fills his soul to hear your voice in his presence. He says, you have made my heart beat faster with a single strand from your necklace at the end of verse 9. And who gave her this necklace? It is not her gift of offering to bring to Him. It is not something she made for Him. But it is His that He commissioned. It was the King. The King's gift to His beloved. You, saint, are the prize of your King. Not because you're just so great and perfect now. Not because you have some hidden value that you have yet to discover in yourself. To the wind with this shallow New Age garbage that you are little gods and therefore God desires you. No, but you are His beloved prize. You are that which He died for. Not because of anything in you, but because of everything in Him. You are His beloved prize because He has made you His beloved prize. He has plunged into the depths of the ocean of death and plucked you out of the muck and made you more valuable than the finest pearls. Your King has clothed you in the finest linens. 
the most valuable jewelry out of the overflow of His love for you. So, know that His love is not contingent on your beauty, on your work and your labor, but in fact, on His work and His love which He lavishes on you. The clothing which He gives you. The graces which He pours out upon you. And we continue on. Verses 10-16 through 16 we'll read together. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey from the comb. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with all the finest spices. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. And the bride calls out, Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices flow forth. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Through these verses we see the beautiful bliss of the marriage covenant. The intimate relation of the Lord Jesus with his bride. And again, we see this garden being brought up. We see this place where they have come to meet together. This place, when he called, when the groom called the bride says, Come away with me, where do they go? But to this very garden. This place of intimate communion, garden locked. Of course, it is the bride. But in the context here, we also see it as where they go together. We hear the bride speak of preparing a garden for her beloved early in the song. And now we finally see them coming to that garden where no one else has been. It is locked. It is filled with wellsprings. It is filled with beautiful fruit. It has been prepared and offered by the bride, but it belongs entirely to the king. And this is the place where they go to be alone together. This secret garden. This garden of the Word where where Christ is alone with His saints. And we see a picture here at the end of chapter 4 of the intimacy of marriage and the wedding night. And how much more beautiful it is to see how the Lord Jesus loves His saints. His bride whom He died for. How He delights in her. And how the King of glory desires to be alone with her. He who has everything in the palm of his hands delights in his church. And now we move to chapter 5. In chapter 5, we see some time passes. The king goes away for a time. Perhaps he goes off to war. Perhaps he goes off to season. Perhaps he goes to build a bigger palace for his queen, but he goes away for a time. And he returns to come and be near to his bride. And the song takes a sad turn here. In chapter 5, verse 2, the bride speaks and she says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is full of dew, my locks with the damp of the night. I've taken off my long sleeved garment. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, how can I dirty them again? My beloved sent forth his hand through the opening, and my feelings moaned for him. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hand dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. And we'll pause here. Actually, we'll go on to verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and passed by. My soul went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. So now we'll take a moment, we'll go back through what just happened here. We see the bride in this passage, and she is alone in the night. It is late at night. She is asleep, verse 2 tells us, but her heart is awake. And this is the one who so passionately loved the king. She did all she could early in the song just to catch a glimpse of him. Chapter 1, where do you pasture your flocks by day? Why should I be one as, as one who veils herself by essentially lesser men? She planned her day so that she could be near to him when he might pass by. 
Now, let's look at something similar to what just happened in chapter 3. We read it a few moments ago. She says in verse 1, she's alone in this context, at, at home, asleep, and on my bed night after night, I sought Him, she says. I sought Him whom my soul loves. I sought Him but didn't find Him. So what does she do? I must arise now and go about the city and seek Him whom my soul loves. So again, we see the passion of this woman. This one who loves her king so deeply. This one who desired him so passionately that she would awake in the night just to be near to him. That she would go out into the dangers of the city just to find him. Until at last, she says, when I found him whom my soul loves, I held on to him and would not let him go. And now, after a time when her beloved comes to her door, after the time of their their marriage ceremony, after the time spent together, Her beloved comes to her door and knocks and says, Open to me. And she answers, How can I? I've taken off my dress. How can I? I've washed up for the night. How can I get up again and dirty my feet? And when she finally comes to herself, she goes to open the door and her beloved is gone. She understands that her beloved had come with dew in his hair, traveling through the night to be with her. And she turns him away because she's tired. She turns him away because she's finished her work for the day. And she'll open to him later. And friends, as we read this tragedy, I want to ask you, all of your time that you've been a Christian in this life, do you still delight in your beloved? Or has your passion gone cold? Do you remember a time where you were so passionate about your love for the king that you would stay up all night in prayer? You wouldn't even bat an eye. You'd stay up all night reading the scriptures just to be alone with him. You were so passionate and full of love for Christ, your Savior, that each moment you could get to be with him was like a cup of cold water for a dry and thirsty soul? Did you used to pray and take joy just to be with Him? Did you used to just delight in the fact that He could draw you away into the garden of His Word and just get lost with Him and forget all else? Because you knew that that time was just for you too. And now what? How many times in the last week have you been lying awake in bed, ready for sleep, You're tired, yes, but your mind's still awake. And you feel the pull and the draw to get up and sneak away in the quiet of the night and seek the face of the Lord Jesus to go and be alone with Him. You hear this, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. Your beloved comes in the, in the dark of the night. It's as though he's been up all night traveling to get to you. His, his locks are covered with the dew of the night. This single-minded devotion to His beloved. And when you feel that pull and that draw to sneak away, you say, not now, Lord, I'm tired. You say, I've had a, a long day and I have to work tomorrow. It's been a hard week. I'm stressed. Not now. I can't get up now. I have to go to sleep. Maybe another time. Maybe this weekend. You say, I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? And you reject Him in communion with Him. And how many times has He come to you like this? How long have you refused and rejected His call to come away with Him? Don't you understand the tragedy of this betrayal? The heartbreak of this? The king has come to his beloved. He's come to the one for whom his heart beats. He desires her. He longs for her. He misses her. He's been up all night coming to her as though she's the one thing he's thought about to get to that door. And he knocks on the door and she won't open to him. She isn't gone. She isn't away. She's inside and he knows it. He hasn't missed her. She's simply refused to open to her beloved. Does this grieve your soul, brothers and sisters? Does it grieve your heart to know that you have done this to your king? And then finally, 
time comes, the bride comes to herself and she goes to open the door. In verses 4-6 through six, she says, My beloved sent forth his hand through the opening and my feelings moaned for him. They were aroused for him. It's like he puts his hand through the door. She says, I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. What happened there? It's as though the groom reached through the door and left kind of a, a scent, a calling card, a perfume, an oil that he has been there. Right? It's not like the bride got up and made herself all pretty to open to her groom. No, as soon as she came to her senses, she came to the door. And the myrrh, the oil, was on the latch as she opened the door. Her hands have this oil on her hands because he's been there. And now he's left. In verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and passed by. My soul went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him. But I didn't find him. I called him, but he didn't answer me. Now, how familiar is this to you? The king calls you away night after night, and night after night you refuse him. And then the time comes after refusing him for so long, you open the door and you say, Ah, now is the time, Lord. Now I can come and be away with you. All my distractions are gone. I've tended to everything else I need to deal with. Now I can be alone. Now I can come to you into devotion like we used to be alone. Now I am ready for you. And you open your Bibles and you close the doors and you go into your prayer closet and nothing. It's as though he's left. It's as though he's gone away. You pray to him and it's as though there's a steel wall over your head. You can't focus. You can't hear a single word. You open the word of God and it's just words on a page. There's nothing there. It's like there's cotton in your ears and you've grown tired and stale and heartbroken. You say, that was just a bad night. I was just tired. This morning, I'll wake up early. This morning, I'll hear from my beloved. And again, you do this whole thing and the time is fruitfulness, fruitless and your, your devotions grow stale. You've opened the door to your beloved and he's gone away. You don't see him. You can't hear Him. It's as if you're alone. Brothers and sisters, if the Lord Jesus were like you and I, then you would be alone. Just one night of refusing to open to Him, He would grow tired and angry, and He would abandon you. But He is different than we are. He is different He's not like me. And He's not like you. He's not gone without a trace. Is this the reality of your devotion right now? You try to be alone with the Lord. You know all the right things to do. You know what's right. You read the same Scripture over and over again. And you're just reminded of memory verses. But there is no passion. It says, oh, He's left. But He hasn't left. We praise God that He is different than you and I. We praise God that He is not petty like you and I. That He is not easily offended. That He is not quick to anger. That He is patient with His beloved. That He is merciful to us. That He does not forget the love which He has for us. Because when he leaves the bride, he leaves something behind for her in verse 5. I alluded to this in a moment. She goes to open the door. And there's myrrh on her hands. There's this perfume. His scent has been placed on the handle. He isn't gone without a trace. He leaves something behind to remind her, I've been near and I'm coming back. And he hasn't forgotten her. And he doesn't want her to forget him. As the king in the song leaves behind his scent, His calling card to show His love that He's been there, that she's missed Him. So does Christ do the same thing with you and I, brothers and sisters. Perhaps many of you are in this season where like the bride in the song, you're going about the streets looking for your beloved. You're trying to pray, you're trying to hear, and there's nothing there. But there's something nagging, something biting and gnawing where you know that He hasn't left you. You're calling out to Him and it's as though He's not there, but you know He's just out of reach because He's left a scent. 
He's left something behind, a seal, a reminder and a promise that He will not abandon you. His very Spirit testifies in your bones that He is near. So we go on, verses 6 through 8. She opened to her beloved. My beloved had turned away and passed by. My soul went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I didn't find him. I called him, but he didn't answer me. Verse 7. She goes out into the city, as she did before in chapter 3. The watchmen who go about the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I call you to solemnly swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him that I'm sick with love. So this bride, there's much here. This bride comes to her senses. She seeks her beloved. She goes out into the dangers of the street, but it can't be that dangerous to her. This is the city of Jerusalem. She's the bride of the king. She's going out to find her beloved as she did once before. Who does she meet? Verse 7, the watchmen in the city. They'll help me. These watchmen, these guards, these night watchmen, they work for my beloved. They'll help me find him. What do they do? They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen on the walls took away my shawl from me. Look how the bride is suffering when she's not with her beloved. It's as if her heart's left her in the night. Because he is her true heart and her king. And look how terribly she's abused when she chases after her beloved. She's besides herself with love. She goes out in the streets and she's found by the guards, the ones who should be protecting her, who have been contracted by the king. These ones tasked with the sole purpose of protecting innocence like hers. And they beat her and they humiliate her this bride of the king. And just an aside here for the preachers, the pastors, and everyone who aspires to preach the word of God to the bride of Christ, this should cause us all to tremble. Because every time you step into the pulpit, you are dealing with the bride of Christ. And you are tasked in preparing a sermon to draw the bride of Christ to her beloved. To take her by the hand and to remind her of her king. The city guards, what should they have done? They should have known the king. They should have known his bride. They should have taken her to him immediately. What do we do? The pastors and the preachers we who are the city guard, the watchmen on the walls, our task is to take the bride by the hand when she's forgotten, when she can't find her beloved. And we show her a picture of her beloved and we say, remember him. Remember this one whom you loved. And we see the necklaces and the earrings which he's prepared for her. This is what we do with an expository sermon. We take each pearl from the very text of Scripture and we take it, and we polish it, and we refine it, and we show it to her, and we say, remember this. Remember this pearl. Do you remember this? From the very word of God which He has given to you. Hold on to this, and we take her farther. And we go to the next point, the next verse of Scripture, and we say, remember this pearl. And we string the, the very words of God together in a sermon, and we put it around her neck, and we say, remember the beloved of yours. Your king, your groom, who made this for you. And look at this string of pearls. Hear the very word of God and look to him. Remember your love for him. Know he hasn't forsaken you. And come with me to see him. But what do these ones do? They beat her. They steal from her. They abandon her. They humiliate her. They steal her clothes away. And let me ask you, friends, when the king finds his bride, and he's about to find her, when the king finds his bride, his beloved, beaten and bruised and ashamed, he sees her stripped and naked without her shawl and without her covering, 
And when he finds that shawl in the hands of his guards, what will he do to them? He will kill them all quickly because they shamed his bride. And they were derelict in their duties. They abandoned their duties. And justice demands their blood. Because not only have they neglected their duties, but they have preyed on the innocent. The innocent of his beloved bride. There will be a day of reckoning for these guards. And so it is in our day, in this day, in the land where the watchman said over Christ's bride, strip her of her beauty, of her, of her garments and her linens which Christ has given her. They sell her on the streets for the world to gain some kind of vain recognition. Every so-called pastor who takes this post lightly, there will be a day of reckoning the very king of kings, for how they treated his bride. It's for this reason that I tremble. It's for this reason that everyone who takes up this, pat, this post to speak to the bride of Christ ought to tremble. Speak lightly and carefully. Step lightly behind this pulpit. Because we know whom we have to deal with. Verses 8 and 9. She says to the daughters of Jerusalem, after abandoned by the guards, she says, I call you, the daughters of Jerusalem, to solemnly swear, if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him that I'm sick with love. And the chorus says, what is your beloved that he is more than any other beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved that he is more than any other beloved, that thus you adjure us, that thus you call us to solemnly swear? Why should we do this work for you? It's almost as if the chorus is perhaps mocking her. This beggar woman on the street is really how she appears by now. She's beg- they're, they're mocking her. How, how great can your beloved be? How can he be better than any other men? Why should we go about the streets with you if he's your beloved and you didn't even open the door to him? Why should we search for him with you? Why should we help you when you couldn't be bothered to let him in? And how does she reply? In verses 9 through 16, she replies and she's beside herself with love. At the end of verse 9, why should we, what is your beloved more than any other beloved that thus you adjure us? And he, she answers, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy, lifted up as a banner among 10,000. His head is like gold, fine gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water washed in milk and sitting in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, towers of sweet scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rod of gold set with beryl. His abdomen a plate of ivory and laid with silver. And she goes on and on and we see this welling up of love in the bride. She who was asleep was not truly asleep. And her sleep was no death for her love, but she's stirred up with love and emotion for her beloved. She's beside herself in adoration when she describes him. She can't even, she's not even making sense. He's so beautiful. His hair is red and ruddy, but it's also gold and it's also black. And he has strong arms and he has bright skin and dark skin and he is everything that is beautiful. And she's just mounting and lavishing this praise on her beloved to those who stand by and watch. Why should we look for you? Because this is why, this is my beloved and this is my friend. His mouth is full of sweetness and he is wholly desirable, O daughters of Jerusalem. And then how do the daughters reply? In verse 1 of chapter 6, they answer, well, where has your beloved gone? O most beautiful among women, where have your, has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Because we see how the daughters of Jerusalem After hearing how the bride describes her beloved in this emphatic way, their hearts are shifted. Their hearts are set on edge to see the reunion of this one, this woman and the one whom she loves. They have to see this glorious one. And they have to see their love to see how this woman so passionately praises and worships her king and her groom. This woman who loves him so much. And I have to ask, How great is your love for the King? How passionate is your worship and your praise 
Or do you just sing these songs, pray these prayers by rote? How many of you would sway the masses to look upward upon the one that you love because of how you praise Him? To say there must be something there. And I'm not talking about silently evangelizing the pagan world. But there is a reality here. You will not change the hearts of wicked men simply by silently loving the Lord. But there is something here that even the pagan world will take a moment to see this love affair of Christ and His bride. And do you praise Him and worship Him in such a way that they will pause and stop to see this one whom you love? You go on, verses 2 through 3 of chapter 6. The daughters of Jerusalem say, okay, well, where is He, essentially? Let's go find Him, O most beautiful among women. She remembers. She was left alone, and now she remembers verses 2 and 3. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to shepherd his flock in the gardens and gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine, he who shepherds his flock among the lilies. After she describes, after she adores, after she praises and worships her beloved, she remembers him and where he has gone to, and she remembers how he, she can find him. He's returned to the garden, to her garden. He hasn't left her. He hasn't gone away and abandoned her. He's gone to that place where they always go to be alone. The garden of chapter 4, prepared by the bride as a gift, an offering of her love. That secret place where no one else can go. That place of solitude for them to be alone is his to enter as he pleases. And that's where he waits for her. And what is it that she should find when she returns? Does she come upon him in the garden sulking, sitting on a rock, picking at daisies and tearing petals off of flowers? Does she come find him pacing and angry, saying, I'll show her a thing or two, not opening to me, leaving me behind? Doesn't she know who I am? I came to her in the night and she wouldn't open to me. Doesn't she know that I'm the king? No. That's not what she sees her beloved doing. In verses 4 through 12, she comes to the garden She knows he's there to gather the lilies, to shepherd his flock. He is working. He is working for his bride, shepherding his flock. He is gathering lilies as though to present to his beloved bride. He is working and laboring to lavish more love on her. And when she remembers, they come to the garden in verse 4, and the king says, You are as beautiful as Terza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem. His love hasn't faded. She doesn't need to pay for offending him. He has loved her the same as the very day he has married her. You are as majestic as an army with banners, he says. Verse 5, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overwhelmed me. Your hair is like a flock of goats. They have leapt down from Gilead. He's overwhelmed by her gaze still. He's not fed up. He's not tired. He's not angry. He's not frustrated. He's overwhelmed by her love. And he lavishes praise. Your temples are slices of pomegranates. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines, verse 8, and maidens without number. But you, verse 9, she is the only one. My dove, my perfect one. She is the only one of her mother. She is her pure one, her only daughter who bore her. The daughter saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this that looks down like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as majestic as an army with banners? And he lavishes praise on his bride. He didn't forsake his beloved. He never forsakes her. He left and went to wait and work in that special place of theirs until she came to him again. Because he knew that she would be drawn away with him again. You can picture it's almost like he gets to the garden and he has this bouquet of flowers for her. It's like he's preparing to store up more love to lavish on her because he knows that she'll be near. And he waits to delight in her again. And I ask you, friends, does this surprise you of our Lord? Does this surprise you that he waits for his bride who is so fickle, 
who so often forgets, who's so rebellious to go after false gods and evil affections, does it surprise you that He waits to lavish more love and grace upon you? On His bride? Is she not His prize? Do you think that the Lord Jesus has left you, saint? Does it feel as though your beloved has rejected you? I tell you the truth, He is not far off. You know where He has gone. You know where you must go. He is in the garden and He waits for you. And He does not wait with a stern word, not with a rod for penance. He waits to be alone with you. And He says, My dove, my perfect one, is unique. She is her mother's only. He says of His bride, You are altogether beautiful to Him. And nothing has changed. Because He doesn't change. So don't stay away flailing yourself for penance, thinking, I have sinned against Him. I can't come near to Him until I've paid my debt. I've rejected Him too long. He doesn't want me. If you think this, then you have sinned against the Lord. If you think this, you're doing the work of your enemy by becoming an accuser yourself. You've sinned against Him by thinking He is petty and fickle like you. And He is not like you, brothers and sisters. He is far greater than you. Unless you think because of His excellence you're unworthy. Remember, friend, you are unworthy. And you were unworthy to begin with. But I tell you, He loves you. And shall not the Lamb receive the reward for His suffering? Has He not suffered to purchase His bride? Shall not the Lamb receive the reward for His suffering? His bride is that reward. You, saint, are a member of that prize. And again, he says, you are altogether beautiful. Now, I want to look at one more passage before we close. Because we see this reconciliation of the bride and the groom. We see this love affair. And I pray we see that the the love of Christ is something altogether different than we can know. I pray that you see in these words that we have looked at so far, saints, His love for you, and that you are emboldened to seek His face, to not make atonement for your sin. Yes, to confess and to be honest, but then to seek His face boldly where He can be found, knowing that He will not reject you. That is the thrust of this message, but I want to look at one other thing. I want to show the saints the exclusive love that Christ has for the church. And if there are any who are not His, who are but pretending, I want to show you something too. I want to see how Christ protects His bride. The bride and the groom are drawn together at the end of chapter 6. They're united And the groom delights in his bride. And the bride goes away with him. It's as though they enter the garden and they start to to walk off, perhaps even dancing off under the cover of the trees. And there's the chorus waiting in verse 13. At the gate, they see this reunion and they say, Come back! Come back, O Shulamite! Come back that we may behold you! These ones who are far off. We see the daughters of Jerusalem. The ones who the bride adjured to help her. Perhaps even scoffed at her request to help. And then quickly shifted their mind at hearing the bride's description. The praise of her love. I want you all to look and see their proximity to the woman and her beloved. They are not in the garden. But they are near the garden. They are outside. And so when the king embraces her bride, it's as if he's taking her away to be in a secluded place with him. And these outsiders, they were given the honor to witness this reunion. They were able to witness the great love of the two and the beauty of the bride as she draws near to her king. But that's all that they can do. They can only look from afar. They cannot partake of the love. They cannot even know the depth of the love. They can only bear witness 
And when the king takes his bride away, they cry for her to come back to them. They long to continue watching. But there's a time when they can no longer even do that. They will not have the right to witness this great love from the outside. And so it is with the outside world and the bride of Christ. And perhaps there are some here even tonight. Perhaps there are members of this congregation who are not the bride of Christ, but they are daughters of Jerusalem walking with her to see this love affair. Like a movie. Like a play. And perhaps for a time you have been given the honor to witness the bride and her groom in love and intimate communion. But there will be a day when you are cut off. When you cannot see anymore. And you have only seen the beginning. At the best of times, you can only bear witness. And the king will answer you one day. The end of, chapter, or end of verse 13 of chapter 6, he'll answer, Why should you behold the Shulamite as at the dance of two companies? Why should you have the honor to look at my bride's beauty? Why? What right do you have to even look at my love as though she is some kind of performance? Let alone, what right do you have to speak to the prize of my heart? What right do you have to call her away from her beloved so that you can see a little bit more? This is exactly what Christ does with His bride. When the world calls her away, when even falsely professing saints call her away, Christ protects His bride. He will not allow them to tear her away from Him. He is a fierce protector of His beloved. And He is a fierce protector of His holy name. And so, as we must always do, we ought to also examine ourselves here. Are you truly a member of His bride? Have you tasted the glory of His love? Or are you only looking at the love affair from afar? Worse, are you drawing His bride away from Him? Attempting to. If you are, repent. There is a way in which you can know this love. It's by acknowledging, recognizing your sin. Recognizing that you are a wretch and unworthy. But if you will look to Christ the Savior, the King in here, the one who purchased His bride, if you will see His love and you desire that love for yourself, but you are far off, how can you draw near? You are stained. You are still covered in your sin. How can you atone for your sin? You can't. But if you will look to Jesus, beaten and bruised and bloodied on the cross, if you will look to Jesus, dead in the tomb for your sins, if you will look to Jesus, raised in glory, in victory over sin and death, and you will look to Him and plea with Him to take your sin from you, to take you into His garden, then you will find Him to be a perfect Savior. You will not have this harsh rebuke. Why should you behold the Shulamite? You will be drawn in with her. Will you not look to Christ? Stop gazing from far off and draw near to her. And so in closing, here is my final blessing to you all who hear these words. May the words of this sermon, and most importantly, may the words of the Lord in the Song of Solomon, rightly divided and rightly applied to each portion of our life, be a soothing balm to the pained conscience of the one who, after examining his soul, has found that he is black and swarthy by the stains of sin. May it comfort those whose hearts cry out, don't look at me because you've been scorched with the oppressive heat and the curse of rebellion. And may it encourage and edify you who have examined yourself with tears of repentance longing for the embrace of your beloved, that He is near. And may it gently spur you to run back to your beloved who has not left you and who has not gone far off. May this sermon and these words motivate you to press deeper into the wellspring of the divine love of Jesus Christ, knowing that it is bottomless, that you may drown in His sweet embrace and live as one beloved. 
And may these words likewise provoke jealousy, leading to repentance in that foolish Pharisee who, seeing the repentant lamentation of his brother, says, I thank you, God, that you did not make me like this one. Because that one will know the glory of his love. I pray, if your heart is hardened and not tender to the provoking words of the Spirit of God, that you'll be provoked to jealousy. If you will not humbly examine yourself and repent, then may you who think you delight the eye of, you, of the groom by your arrogant self-assurance soon see the bride with her love from the outside, far off and walking away with him. And may you, O oh proud heart, who would seek to sear your conscience and bolster your rebellion by this sermon on the steadfast love of Christ for His covenant bride, may you see the Lord of glory carry His bride off in His arms only to cry out, come back, and to be answered, why should you gaze at my beloved? She is not here for you. Let's pray. Father God, I confess that I have gone far off and been delighted with affections, worldly affections. I have made excuses to leave the door locked, to not come away with you, to stay in Lebanon. I've made excuses that you'll always be near. How often do I make these excuses? How often do we sing this dance, sing this song and dance this dance? And each time I'm reminded of your patience and your mercy towards someone so unworthy like myself. Lord, will you take me into your garden once again? Will you take my brothers and your sisters away with you into your garden again? May my soul delight in you alone again. And by delighting in you, would you use my delight to lead my family into your garden and my church and my brothers and sisters, not for any glory of my own, but that your bride may know your love and be filled with joy, inexpressible, because you are pleased to lavish your love upon your bride. Would you bless the reading and the preaching of your word and cause us to respond in joyful adoration of you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.